Hello. So, um, we're here in Poznan, Poland, and it's Susanna Zorowski's last day here with us. Uh, we've had three wonderful days together, together with Luca Lampariello as well, speaking in a number of different languages. And one thing that I thought would be really useful to talk about is something that you wrote a book about, Susanna, and that's the connection between language and music. Right. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your book? And how, and how you see language and music and their symbiotic behavior. Sure, so <clears throat> the, the connection between language and music is that language and music in the brain occupy similar parts of the brain, but also they have places in the brain where they're not activated in the same place. So music can actually be used to reactivate language functions, and we can see that right now with in the United States, Representative Gabrielle Giffords, who was shot in the head a year and a half ago, and she's working with a music therapist to regain her verbal abilities. And I learned about this by reading a book called Musicophilia by a British neurologist, Oliver Sacks. He's the same one who wrote Awakenings. That was a movie that was made in it was made into a movie with uh, Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. And he talked about how music affects the brain and how music activates more parts of the brain than language does. And I realized that I listen to languages like music, so I pick up on the ups and downs of language, the intonation, the, um, the stresses, but also I listen to a lot of foreign language music, and that helps me learn languages. And the other part that I think that is missing in the school system, or any, many academic environments for languages, is that when you learn a language, you have to give yourself up to the language. In Spanish, say, me tengo que, hay que entregarse a la, a la lengua, ¿no? Pero en, en las escuelas, no se enseña algo del alma. Se enseña, ok, aquí tenemos un libro, hay vocabulario, hay la gramática, hay que memorizarlo. Pero hay que entregarse eh, al idioma. Y, y lo que hace el, 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 la música es que no solamente que activa más parte del cerebro que el idioma hablado, pero nos activa a nivel emocional. Y hay que tener, un, hay que tener, tener algo a nivel emocional con el idioma, porque si no, nunca lo vas a hablar muy bien, vas a tener un acento, tal vez no va a ser un acento muy mal, pero, o sea, no, no vas a sentir el idioma, y hay que sentir el idioma, y eso, y eso es muy importante con la música. Entonces en mi libro uh -huh. hablo de cómo utilizar canciones sí. para aprender idiomas, pero también cómo escuchar el idioma hablado como si fuera una canción. She's the expert, so... <laughs> <laughs> Lucina, you, you talked about the music as well, haven't you? And, and you compare it to the way you learn pronunciation yeah, in the language. Yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to add, she, she, she did a wonderful analysis of the, of the problem. And the thing is that in school, it is not just... Uh, they don't teach it well enough, and then emotions are involved. Nobody talks about emotions, so it's about books, about grammar. And then people are not motivated, plus the content is not uh, interesting at all. Uh, but apart from that, yeah, uh, to answer your question, I think that language is music in the real sense of the word. Uh, it's just a melody. If you, uh, people normally talk, when they talk at normal speed, you don't realize that we have tones. Every language has tones, has uh, stops, has uh, pitch, stress, etc. So if you see a little bit like, uh, you know, music, they, they teach it, literally they teach it. They can teach music, how to play music. You can play, and we have vocal cords, which are instruments, so you can uh, teach people how to use their vocal cords uh, well. And in this sense, language is music, in the real sense of the word. You know, it's not just something that you say like that. It's, um, if, you, if, you say it, and if you believe it, you can learn accordingly, you know, you can. I think language is pronunciation and intonation. Uh, they're made too difficult. There's a lot of books, interesting books, from a scientific point of view. They're made too complicated. Uh, I think we, in general, I, I have a way. <clears throat> I teach pronunciation, I teach intonation. Pronunciation is just the pronunciation of simple words, how words are supposed to be produced mechanically. But then, uh, like a language is the aggregation of sounds, which is something different, more complicated. That's the reason why a lot of people have problems with intonation rather than pronunciation. Also with pronunciation, but the real problem is intonation. So, I agree with Susanna here. I remember something that you were telling me about earlier, Luca, is that you know, the problem in school is that we learn how to pronounce one word at a time, but when, we put, when people try to put the words together, 
doesn't sound good. It almost sounds like you know a voice translation or something like mm -hmm. that. I go to the school. It's just not natural. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's because uh, you know they they're not taught to after sentences like in Chinese. This is uh, the glaring example of this. They teach people how to pronounce the single tones, but then people cannot say sentences. They even when they do learn tones rather well. They still sound stiff because they don't. They're not taught to say sentences like the Chinese. The Chinese uh, learn since they're little kids how to pronounce entire sentences. They learn. I uh, didn't learn wo shi. They learn wo shi, and then and you know they learn it accordingly. So that's the reason why they can speak like natives and foreigners. It takes them a long time and then a lot of effort, and a lot of them just give up because I think the approach is wrong. And look, I think. You learned a lot of uh, your languages through songs, or some of your languages through songs. How, how did you do it? Um, to tell you the truth, um, I perfected languages. Mm -hmm. Songs it means that, especially in English, when I have, I think I have a large vocabulary. I listen to thousands of songs, and you know, I wanted to uh, understand what they, they were talking about, <laughs> they were singing. So I went and looked at the script, etc., etc., and that I looked up the words, meaning of the words. So yeah, it, and. Uh, and like Richard, we like singing all <laughs> the time. We get up in the morning and we sing all the time, even in the shower, everywhere. So I heard it's on the street too. On the street, of course. <laughs> everywhere, it's always totally everywhere. In the bar, in the restaurant, in the street, in the shower. So that that is a good way to. Um, I think it's also for intonation because uh, even if singing is not the same thing as speaking, it's a different thing, but it still helps. You know, we got this in common. We like singing. So there must be a connection. I'm sure there's a connection between even pronunciation, intonation, and music. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure, for sure. And something that also I think teachers forget to talk about when it comes to learning songs is that with the songs, not only do you learn vocabulary, but you're also learning the grammar, and you remember. Well, if the song is incorrect, it is incorrect English, or whatever language it is. But you remember certain grammatical forms, and that definitely helps me. You know, like one of my issues with Portuguese is trying to remember the what is it, the futuro, the subjuntivo, or whatever that mm -hmm. doesn't exist in, in Spanish, it doesn't exist in any other language I know. Mm -hmm. So I look for it in song, or I listen for it in songs, and I try to understand. Okay, how is it that this is foreign? Why do you say cuando yo for instead of cuando yo yo vou? Mm -hmm. and, and so that's the, that's the kind of stuff that I'm even using right now. And then I even found in uh, spoken speech that I'll be speaking and I can't think of a word and I'll hear it in my head, I'll hear the song in my head, not the whole song, I'll hear like a verse. And usually I don't start breaking out in song in the middle of a sentence, maybe I will. Start singing. Yeah, <laughs> depends, on the, depends on the environment. But I'm I'll looking hear... for a word. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a good one. But I'll hear the song in my head and then I'll say the word. And so, you know, you think that, oh, it's, it's only for children to listen to music. No, I mean, even for adults, I'm even using songs. And one of the examples that I give is that Russian is my first language, and I learned how to read and write in Russian before I learned how to read and write in English. But there was no alphabet song when I was a kid for the Russian alphabet. There is, I think there is now. So even though I can read and write in Russian, I don't remember the order of the alphabet. And so when I have to look for a word in the Russian dictionary, I have a lot of trouble because I can't remember the order of the alphabet. And I... I have to look at the first page of the alphabet and see the, mm -hmm. all the letters. Whereas in English, if you forget the order of the alphabet, you just start singing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Mm -hmm. And it sounds quite silly, but mm -hmm. here I am, an adult, a literate adult, and I sometimes have to sing the ABC song to remember you know, the order of the alphabet. Fantastic. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting insight into your worlds and how your languages and music tastes and the way you use it combine to really enhance your, your learning. So thanks for your time and thanks for a great few days in, in uh, Poznan. Thanks Thank for hosting you. us. Bye. Bye.